So something else we heard about in the last session is that I think one of the most exciting areas where we, even though it's challenging, we may have a, uh, a discovery around the corner is the field of dark matter. And so this is why I think it's exceptionally exciting to be able to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Lena Nassib, who is a world expert in the, the topic of dark matter. So just to give you some background, Professor Nassib obtained her undergraduate degrees in mathematics and physics from Boston University uh, before obtaining her PhD in theoretical physics uh, from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Afterwards, she moved to the West Coast and uh, she was awarded a, a long series of prestigious fellowships, including the Sherman Fairchild Fellowship at Caltech, the Presidential Fellowship at UC Irvine, and finally the uh, Fellow in Theoretical Astrophysics at the Carnegie Observatory. I had to write all these down. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, no, no. So uh, last year, Professor Nassib actually moved back to Boston, uh, in, in particular back to MIT, where she's now a, a faculty member. So although Professor Nassib has worked on a wide range of both theoretical physics, uh, particle physics and astrophysics topics, it's really in the understanding of dark matter, particularly in our own milky way, that she is a world expert, and that's what she's going to be telling us about today. So lastly, I'd just like to say on a personal note, it's a real pleasure to be giving this introduction. I was actually the year below Lena at graduate school, and so I've seen firsthand what a wonderful physicist she is, and so I'm really looking forward to what she's able to share with us today. So please join with me in welcoming uh, Professor Nassib. Thank you so much for having me here, and thanks, Nick, for that really, really sweet um, introduction. It's kind of very weird for him to be saying Professor Nassim. I'm like, dude, <laughs> we've been a, like drinking beers together, well, kind of, <laughs> when we were in grad school. Anyways, so yeah, I'm very excited to tell you today about the genealogy of the Milky Way and how that actually is related to the search of dark matter. But before we do that, and let's see if we have any further technical issues, uh, I would like us to test uh, the following. Oh, here we go. OK, so galaxies merge together. That's cool. And um, also, fair warning, um, you, this beautiful, gorgeous town is literally and figuratively breathtaking. <laughs> so I do have a hard time with altitude. So if I end up out of breath, that's why. Um, OK. so. If you don't mind pulling up your phones and doing this, just so, well, first of all, it's interesting to know the age distribution, but mainly because I have questions later and I want to make, make sure that this is working. So if you don't mind opening like a Chrome or anything on your, on your phone um, and then going to that website all the way in the top, polyv.com, and make sure it's open uh, and backslash my name 299. And then, here we go, we start getting answers. That's great. Um, the answers should pop up as you go. And it's working, so that's actually quite reassuring for me. <laughs> oh, It's hard for me to see the number of answers. I wonder if just everybody is just there. <laughs> oh, there we go. Ooh. Interesting. Really? Oh, this is a nail biter now. <laughs> and there will be some physics questions later, but yeah. Whoa. Oh, we have some young people. I'm so glad you're here. Actually, we have a pretty well wide. Oh, wow. OK. Oh, this distribution is fun. All right, <laughs> we'll see when it stabilizes, but yeah. Okay, every member of this group is represented. That's amazing. Um, thank you so much for being here today and spending your afternoon with us. Uh, let's wait until, okay. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> it keeps changing. Okay, so maybe I'll wait 10 more seconds and then we can get going, but this is quite incredible. Thank you for getting this working and kind of participating. Um, yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of the talk as well. <laughs> All right, um, let's keep going. So the first thing that I would like to do is put everything to scale. And we start from, you know, a beautiful visual of the Earth. Um, I wanted to actually make a video that comes out of Aspen and zooms out, but I have a kid, he doesn't sleep, so, <laughs> you know. Unfortunately, we start from here. The cool thing is that I'm from North Africa, and probably this is like the one picture that the one time a year it's actually cloudy back home, <laughs> but it is what it is. So 
We are here on Earth, but we're trying to zoom out. We're going to kind of pass by the moon and meet the sun, which is located at about eight light minutes away, which means light takes about eight minutes to come to us. And you can see it here. And then I'm going to speed up the movie a little bit because there are a lot, a lot of stars as we go up and out of the galaxy, really, to see where we actually live. So this is really telling us that we are quite very, very, very small. Anyways, we, are, we live there, right at the edge of that beautiful galaxy here. <clears throat> and this is the Milky Way, and this is kind of the topic of the first half of the talk. And I will make sure to kind of relate it to the question of dark matter later. But the first part is really how does a galaxy like this come to be? So the universe was born about 13 billion years ago, and after a lot, <laughs> it's happened, we end up with a galaxy like this. So how does that happen? So now I'm going to show you a simulation of how do we make one of such galaxies. So this movie is, gonna, is running at about reach of 10, so a long time ago. And all the light here is actually stars. And what I would like you to focus on is the number of mergers, so a lot of the number of things that actually hit this galaxy to make it the galaxy that ends up today. And it's a lot. A lot is going on really. And then you can kind of see that disk and things kind of stabilizing and looking a little bit more like the Milky Way from the slide before. But this is basically how galaxies form. Not just the one simulated one, but really how galaxies form a lot in general. It's a very cannibalistic process where every galaxy kind of eats a lot of other galaxies and that's how it grows. So because you know cannibalism is not really a fun analogy, let's move on to something a little bit nicer, which is that of a family tree. So basically, we're going to try to explore the parents and cousins and relatives of the Milky Way. So what I'm going to do here is have this genealogy of the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is all the way down here. And we're going to try to figure out and fill up some of its relatives. I'm not going to fill the entire tree, because that would be a lot. Um, so. I'm going to put time here where the oldest mergers, the oldest things are going to be all the way on the top. The newest ones are going to be all the way on the bottom. And before that, I would like to introduce the different merging stages that happen. Uh, and we're going to go through them one by one. So the merging stages we're going to have, so we imagine we have our Milky Way. And then we're going to have a merging galaxy, so another galaxy that just like slamming right into us. And then after a while, it's, getting starting, it's gonna start getting disrupted into what we call a stellar stream, which I will discuss further. And then after a while, that stellar stream becomes something called debris flow, where we, don't, we really lose that structure. But let's kind of get into it when we get into it. So from the video of like the Earth zooming out, there was already something that you might have noticed. So I'm not going to rerun the whole video. Let's start from the sun again. Move out. And we see the beautiful Milky Way. But there is somebody lurking right there. And it's this guy. So that is the Large Magellanic Cloud. Actually, there is another guy right behind him. And that's the Small Magellanic Cloud. But let's just focus on this guy first. So the Large Magellanic Cloud is a galaxy um, that is about 1-ish percent of the mass of the Milky Way, 1 to 10, uh, mass of the Milky Way. And it is what we call first infall, which means that it is just coming in to hit us. OK? N nothing's going to happen to us. So it's going to take a few billion years anyway. So we're going to be fine. But so this Large Magellanic Cloud is actually merging into our galaxy, which means that it should belong, slash maybe it will belong to our family tree. And indeed, I'm going to put it right down here. And that's Magellan. I was very proud of myself when I found that one. Anyways. <laughs> OK, so this Large Magellanic Cloud is actually really low because it's still in the process of merging. But it is not the only galaxy that actually does that. So we're going to focus on this first stage first. How many of these merging galaxies do we have? And the answer is quite a few, or at least we've discovered quite a few, because there are these satellite galaxies, and sometimes we refer to them as dwarf galaxies, that orbit our, our center of Milky Way. So the Milky Way is this circle around here. 
And these dots, the blue ones, are actually some of these dwarf galaxies that are just orbiting and getting sucked into the Milky Way potential. Eventually, some will hit in different various ways, which will be a lot of fun. Um, and the Large Magellanic Cloud is actually here. It's the LMC. It's also orbiting pretty close. And it's going to enjoy getting sucked into the Milky Way, and that's how we're going to grow as a galaxy, which is great. So after some time, though, they're not going to be just these bound galaxies that are just sitting right there. They're going to start getting disrupted. So I'm going to take as an example, this is the Milky Way right here, and I'm going to have three different galaxies, so like one, two, three, and I'm going to run a simulation or a movie forward to see what happens to those galaxies. So because the gravitational potential or the gravity of the Milky Way is different on this side and on the other side of this galaxy, the stars actually are getting shredded in a slightly different way, which means that we end up with these beautiful structures in the sky where different stars are actually in going through slightly different orbits. And then you end up with what we call like the leading arm and the trailing arm of these stellar streams. So we have these beautiful, gorgeous stellar streams that tell us actually that <clears throat> indeed our theory is that galaxies form through you know, eating a process of each other actually do happen, and it's true. And in particular, we can actually see this in our telescopes where, <coughs> oops, in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we actually have this beautiful image from back in 2007, which has been, or is currently being updated, of what we call the field of streams. So if you look at the sky, there are, there are these over densities of stars, so that one, this one, so this is GD1 stream, this is the Orphan stream, this is Palomar 5, and this is the Sagittarius stream. And as you can imagine, stars don't just randomly become a line in the sky, and it's, it's just this disruption process. So this <clears throat> leads us to the second stage of merging, or mergers, or which is stellar disruption and that of a stellar stream. One thing that I would like to point out, though, <clears throat> is that not all the beautiful streams here are actually end up in our, are gonna end up in our family tree. And the reason for it is because they're not all galaxies. Some of them are actually just what we call globular clusters, which are clumps of stars that are born from the same gas. So you can imagine you have like a clump of gas and then out of gas, when the gas cools down below a certain temperature, it turns into a star. So these, they become like clumps of stars. And because they're just clumps of stars and the gravitational potential of the Milky Way, they're also gonna get disrupted the same way. So these guys are not gonna be part of our merger tree. However, Sagittarius is indeed part of, gonna, of our merger tree because it is a galaxy that is being disrupted. It's actually quite gorgeous um, in the sky. So here is what happened to Sagittarius. <laughs> eight, about eight billion years ago, it came in and its first passage happened at about 5.7 billion years ago. So you have like, the galaxy and this is, you can see it, it was like one single clump. And then after a while, <clears throat> it's, gonna, it's starting to have that tail uh, as the stars are getting disrupted. And then <clears throat> a few billion years ago, a few billion years later, it's gonna go up, and then it's gonna go into a second passage here. And finally, about a billion years ago, it's gonna go into its third passage. So right now, this is our galaxy, and this is what Sagittarius looks like. It's quite huge, actually, and it's absolutely gorgeous to look at. So, this is to compare with the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is right now in what we call a first infall, so more or less like between these two stages. So from that, we actually know that Sagittarius belongs into our family tree, and indeed, we're going to put it right here, because it is going to be a little bit older than the Large Magellanic Cloud that has merged in um, a few billion years ago and had already did, done three different passages. <clears throat> However, it's not the end of Sagittarius, and in a few billion years, it's actually gonna be completely consumed by the Milky Way, which is pretty cool. Uh, well, maybe not cool, but anyways, <laughs> I think it's fun. So from that, we move on to the last stage, which is that of a debris flow. And debris flow is what I can think of is that you lose that structure. You don't really see the lines anymore, but 
things still have some kind of information that they have merged in. So for that, I think of the analogy of long distance runners. So let's take a look at the women's race of the 400 meters from London Olympics 2012. The only reason I picked this one is the first one on YouTube that showed up. But anyways, <laughs> so first thing you see that uh, the athletes are actually kind of organized on one line right here, right? Then we start the race, they kind of keep moving. And what I would like to point out is that after a while they lose this beautiful structure, even though they're more or less all moving at the same speed. So start the race, I'm gonna speed up the middle because you know, they're just running. Um, and towards the end, you can see, oh, there we go. That the, the, you don't really see that structure anymore. You just see this clump of athletes that are moving at more or less the same speed, plus or minus just a little bit, for, to make sure that they're winners and not so winners. <laughs> um, so debris flow is just like that, where our stars have moved into a quite a few orbits until we lose that structure so we can't really see it. So from there you might wonder, how can we detect these things if we can't really see them in the sky as like these beautiful structures? So for that you need a very fancy, somewhat expensive um, speed gun which is Gaia. So Gaia is a space telescope that was launched in December 2013 and has given us the largest kinematic stellar catalog, which is a lot of words for we know about where 1.8 billion stars are and how fast they're going. And that is mind boggling. That's, it's so large actually, um, uh, because Caitlin earlier said that you can download a lot of stuff on your laptop. You cannot download this one on your laptop. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> um, but it is one of the coolest data sets that we have. So I'm going to show you, for example, what the images that we get out of Gaia is just something like this, where um, we take the velocities of these stars, and then I'm going to zoom in at the very, very small, tiny 96 million <laughs> stars, and then we run them based on their velocities in a movie forward 800,000 years, and you can kind of see them move. And it's, it's incredible. Uh, I can't just explain how amazing that is. And indeed, in 2018, we actually discovered a new merger that is in this state of debris flow out of just this beautiful data set. And this is called Gaia Enceladus. So Enceladus is um, a Greek giant, son of, uh, son of Gaia, and Gaia is actually um, um, the Earth, uh, the Earth God. So it's pretty cool, Enceladus is pretty cool. Anyways, this giant um, actually is a merger that has happened about six to 10 billion years ago, and its mass was one to 10% of the Milky Way. So what I'd like to show you is actually what happened uh, in a simulation, obviously. So this is the Milky Way, and then the bottom here, we have this Gaia Enceladus. So a few billion years ago, it actually started running, it hits the Milky Way, and you kind of see it that it's really disrupting some of, the, some of these stars, and it lands into this elongated shape here, which is why, and it's so unfortunate, the first person who discovered it, discovered it, Vasily Belukharov, actually called it the sausage. We make fun of him at every conference for that. At some point he kind of sort of was like, oh, I think I discovered something else, I'm gonna call it potatoes, and we were like, please stop. We can't, no. Anyways, so this Gaia sausage or Enceladus actually is everywhere. We live at about here, so a lot of these stars around us are actually part of these, you know, um, accreted stars, or stars that are coming out, of, coming out of a different galaxy. So you might wonder how can we actually see it? Well, we can use our fancy speed gun from Gaia and actually look at their velocities. Okay, so this might get a little bit more technical, but let's think of it this way. We have the, this is the speed distribution. Basically, for each star, how fast is it going? And the reason that this is interesting is because it looks like there are like two bumps in here. So I like to think of it as a highway. That's the four years living in LA kind of get you. <laughs> so you can think of it as there are two bumps. One of them is negative, and it's because of the stars coming this way. And one of them is positive because of the cars going the other way. 
So the cars are going more or less the same speed. It's just like, it's a highway. They're going that way, and then coming that way. So basically, these stars are just like going into, going very forward and then doing almost a 180 and then coming back. And this very specific signature really tells us that there are some very interesting stars that have a very interesting origin and that kind of we can build, that's how we can build our merger tree. So our Gaia Enceladus right here ends up further on top of our merger tree because it is actually indeed older and it had enough time to actually kind of completely break apart. So as you might understand now, that there are a lot of different kind of methods and ways to build this family tree and understand what's happening to the Milky Way, and in particular, understanding how it formed, really. So how can we do this? How can we identify these stars that have, be, that have been born elsewhere and were brought in through these mergers? How can we build the family tree? So, Let's go back a little bit on a review of what the galaxy is. So this is the Milky Way. We live about here at the edge. And we have different populations of stars. So we have the bulge, and these are older stars. They're kind of like orbiting like the center, so they're minding their own business, really. And they kind of came from how uh, very early on in the formation of the galaxy. Then we have the disk stars, which is slightly younger stars, just like the sun. So the sun is only five billion years old, which is like really, really young in star ages. And these stars actually just like go in orbits around the galaxy. They kind of sometimes go up and down a little bit over the disk, but they're pretty confined to where it is. And that's because they're formed out of the gas that has makes the Milky Way. So the sun is formed into the, from the Milky Way, and we're just where we are. So now the interesting guys are right here from what we call halo and substructure. These are the merging stars or what we call the accreted stars. And their orbits are a lot more fun because they're not confined to a disk. They're way too cool for that. They're like, we can go anywhere we want. And mainly it's because they have been merged from a different galaxy. So they have different initial conditions and it's just gravity and the wild west and they can go whatever they want. So the stars that we really, really need are these, uh, these beautiful stars that are going like crazy. So the fact that they're here doesn't mean that they're always here. They go through the disk sometimes. And the Gaia, the Gaia mission can see the stars really close to us because they're a lot brighter, right? So what we want is to kind of like chase those stars as they cross. However, Unfortunately, only 1% of the stars that are really, really close to us end up being accreted. So this is really the true definition of needle in a haystack. How can we search for these guys? And of course, when you're facing something really, really hard, you just make a computer do it. So we're gonna use artificial intelligence or machine learning techniques to train a computer to distinguish the stars born in the Milky Way from the stars that are born somewhere else and just came around to hang out. So how can we do this? Well, we can teach a neural network. Basically, we teach a computer, this is what a cat looks like. We give it a lot of pictures of different cats. And it's like, OK, I got it. And then we teach it, we give it a lot of pictures of a dog or different dogs. And then it's like, OK, I think I got this. And then we just ask it a question, is this a cat or a dog? And to be honest, I had to wait until the end of this video first time because it was like, I, I can't tell. Apparently, it's a dog in the laundry basket. But a computer could figure it out after it has seen thousands, maybe millions of cats and dog pictures. So what we want here is to actually give it something to train on. So we need to tell it what a star in, you know, born in the Milky Way looks like versus what a star that is somewhere else looks like, and it has to figure out the distinction. So here is the next polling question. Everybody get their phone ready. So the question is, which one, if any, of these two galaxies is real? And which one is the, is the fake simulated one that I'm teaching my computer how to use. So let's start this. 
So answer A is the top one. I think you should see a picture, big, bigger picture of it. I hate that I can't make that one bigger. Um, B is the bottom one. C, neither, is the real one, which I could have just given you a picture of two simulated galaxies. Or it's both. So it's both, like it's the same galaxy, just from slightly different telescopes. Who knows? So, OK. Oh, I can see the total results this time. Cool. This will be fun. <laughs> we got 22, yeah, okay, 23, all right, okay, maybe 10 more seconds for anyone, and then we're going to get to see which one, what is the answer distribution. Seven, all right, five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. Okay, well, thanks for answering and playing the game. It was actually really fun for me. Um, all right, whoa, okay, we got a distribution. Um, okay, so the second one is 44%, almost half. Um, I like that actually 11% of you don't have any trust in me. <laughs> I think I'm like, I'm just uh, evil. Okay. Actually, you add these two, it's a third of you who don't trust me. That's terrifying. Okay. Well, <laughs> the actual answer is this one. Yes. So, yay. It is the second one. And in the other talks, I've been a lot sneakier because you can see here, I actually left the large Magellanic cloud there. And this is the small Magellanic Cloud. Actually, uh, yeah, in some talks I hide them <laughs> just because I think it's fun. So indeed, the first one is a simulated galaxy based on some of the simulations that I showed you early on. And we can just like make basically a catalog of what Gaia would see if there were real galaxies. And then we can teach the computer how to do this and then apply, apply it to actually date Gaia. So, we train on simulations and then label the Gaia stars. And then the question is, is this star accreted or not? And the computer has to figure it out. Of course, the quest, the, we're not really training on pictures, we're training on velocities and positions, but the concept is still the absolute same. So what we get out of it is a catalog, basically a bunch of stars that the computer says, I'm pretty sure you know, when define pretty sure, but I'm pretty sure these stars are all accreted. So then we just like put them on random plots with a lot of numbers, but you know, it doesn't really matter. What matters here is that the first thing that you get out of this catalog, you get like a lot of bunch of stars, and then you're like, okay, let me see if I can get back the stuff that I already know should be there, because I want to make sure that my computer's doing the right thing. So indeed, you see this double, like double peak structure here, like this over density here and over density here, that's the same thing that I talked about earlier, the highway. So that's indeed the Gaia Enceladus. And we were like, oh, okay, this is working. We got the Gaia Enceladus, everything's fine. Um, so this is interesting. And then you take another look and you're like, wait, what is that? Like, that, I didn't really think that would be there. And just, a bit onto the psyche of grad students and researchers in general is that, you know, when you start grad school, you're like, I'm gonna discover everything and get a Nobel Prize. And then a few bugs later and some scolding from your advisor, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's terrible, what are you doing? And you get very existential. You figure out that every time you see something like that, you're like, oh my God, I screwed up again. <laughs> Where did I have a bug? Ugh. Anyways, so when I first saw that, honestly, I didn't tell anyone for three weeks. I was like, I messed up. I, 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 no, I can't tell people. <laughs> and then I was trying to figure it out every which way. And then at some point it hit me and I was like, wait, oh my God, this is real. <laughs> That's insane. Because you don't really expect those to happen. I mean, they make it sound cool in the movies, but no. 
So the cool thing is that if you find something new, you get to name it. And I wasn't going to go after sausage or waffles or God knows what. Also because I hate food. <laughs> Sorry, Caitlin. <laughs> Not really a big foodie. So what I went for is Nyx, which is the Greek goddess of the night. I thought that was particularly fitting for uh, a stream of stars. So now you will have to bear with me because I'm obviously in love with these stars, so I'm going to talk about them. So there are about 100 stars right here, and they're all moving in the same direction, more or less. And this is for reference what the sun is. So this is the plane of the galaxy. Let me have slightly better visuals. So you can see that these stars are all going that way. So if I overlaid the Milky Way on top, it looks like this. So they're all kind of going towards the center, and they're all going together. And then if I wanted to see how far off the plane they are, I can take a look like here. And you can see that some of them are within the disk of the galaxy, and some of them are actually a little bit above and a little bit below. So that's very intriguing, because what we want to know is, like, what is this thing? So maybe Nix is a merger that actually has happened. Maybe. I have a question mark here. In which case, because the stars are all moving the same way, it's kind of like a stellar stream-ish. So I would think it would be somewhere between Sagittarius and the Gaia Enceladus, but we're not really, really sure. Getting a little bit more accurate, what are the possible theories for this? Well, Nix could be a merging galaxy, or it could be a disk perturbation. Let me explain. A merging galaxy, just like all the mergers that I've talked about, something coming in, hitting the galaxy, just, you know, spiraling in, the usual. And actually, there is something very cool about it if indeed it is a merging galaxy. But if it is a disk perturbation, it means that something else, maybe Sagittarius, question mark, has hit the, hit the galaxy. And you can think of the galaxy as like water, and you kind of dropped like um, a rock in it. And there are waves. And basically, these waves are just like these stars are, that are in slightly new orbits. And this Nix is just like these stars that are disk stars, but now are in funny orbits just because something has hit the Milky Way. So which is it? How can we figure it out? Well, what we can do is actually go and observe these stars. And you can do these with these beautiful telescopes. Uh, this one is actually Magellan. It's in Chile. And the sky looks this nice. Oh my god. So I was so excited. I was like, oh my god, I'm going to go to Chile and actually see this. And then the pandemic hit, so we didn't. <laughs> but we got the chance to actually do this remotely. So uh, we got to observe this here in we're using this beautiful telescope in Chile and also another telescope in Hawaii, which, again, I really wanted to go to, um, but didn't get to go. And what we want when we observe these is actually figure out the light coming out of these stars, because the light can tell us what is the star made of? Like, what are the different chemicals that made the stars? So then we can compare it with what we know, the chemicals of the disk stars versus chemicals of stars that are born somewhere else. So they will have a different composition. And <clears throat> unfortunately, well, we're still analyzing the data. So fingers crossed. We still don't know, which is pretty common in physics. <laughs> but um, it actually has been a very, very intriguing and interesting investigation. So now you might wonder, if it is a merging galaxy, what would it look like? And lucky enough, I have a simulation, yet another one, sorry, <laughs> that kind of looks like it. And here it is. So that's the galaxy. And then you see something coming in and hitting it and kind of like getting dragged in that same rotation, right? And that's why it's actually quite interesting, because the fact that it's dragged in that same way can lead us to to know a lot of things about something that I haven't talked about yet. And I will soon, so I promise I'm not going to break into song. <laughs> you know what this is. No? Yeah. If you have kids, you're like, I hate this song. <laughs> I can't listen to it anymore. We don't talk about Bruno. <laughs> Again, I have a horrible singing voice, so I'm not going to. But we don't talk about dark matter, but dark matter is right there. And it's kind of like it plays a huge part in this entire story. So let's go back and see where this is coming from. OK, rewind, 1930s. We thought that galaxies looked like this. Pretty lame. I mean, they look really cool, actually. So, But we live outside here, and we can see that these places, 
these stars are actually rotating a lot slower than the stars in the center. We're like, okay, well, it is what it is. That's, we, we move slow, that's cool. And then in the 1970s with the work of Vera Rubin and collaborators, we actually found out that galaxies look a lot more like this, where you can see that the edge of the star, like the edge of the galaxy, just like ours, is rotating a lot faster. So then you're like, wait, what? This, this is not what I expected. All my theories actually tell me that I should live in a galaxy like this. So what is going on? And basically you end up facing a galactic anomaly. And I think this was one of the questions earlier. How do you solve it? Do you think it is, do you have to modify gravity or is it this new something that you need to add to make peace with this very strange what we call rotation curve. Like, why is our galaxy rotating, and other galaxies really, rotating in a slightly different way? So, what I would like to do is actually go into a little bit of a story of basically these two instances in history, okay? So, let's go back to uh, the 1840s now, so quite a long time ago, and there are, have been two physicists quite separately uh, a British, uh, Adams, and a French, Le Verrier, who independently noticed that there are some changes or irregularities in the orbit of Uranus. So it's one of our planets, and this is the sun, we live close by, and then sometimes you, see it, you think it's supposed to be here and you, think, and you find it a little bit ahead of its orbit, and sometimes it's a little bit behind, and you're like, wait, what is going on? We can't really explain it. So both of them, again, separately, um, got into the same conclusion that there must be another planet hiding right here somewhere that is really kind of pulling at Uranus sometimes in a way that is affecting its orbit. So how do you do this? Well, Adams was like, you will, I promise you, you will find it right there. Le Verrier, you will find it right there. Which is, again, it's the 1840s, okay? And then Neptune, was right there. And it was discovered on September 23rd, 1846. Right? I know. Even though it was like 200 years ago, and I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> so it kind of goes into like the absolute gorgeousness of physics when you make a prediction and then you find it. The Higgs, which we talked about earlier, they made that prediction in the 1960s. And then in 2012, we were like, we found it. And everyone is like, that's amazing. That's the coolest thing. So. This was also a victory for Newtonian physics and gravity, like we understand what's going on, we can even predict stuff, we can see it later, oh, incredible. So then people, I think, got a little bit cocky. <laughs> and we have another anomaly, which is Mercury. So this is very much exaggerated. But Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, and it has some kind of precession. So precession really means that, you know, it moves into an ellipse and then the whole ellipse actually shifts a little bit every time. So it kind of moves, it starts like this and then, and then moves another orbit like this and then moves another orbit and it's a little bit, you know, that. So people were like, okay, this is the same Neptune story again. I know the answer. It's gonna be another planet right there, hidden very close to the sun. And this planet is, I'm gonna name it Vulcan. And that should be it. Unfortunately, it was not actually. What actually ended up being is we had, we had to change the laws of gravity from Newtonian gravity to general relativity. So general relativity was the answer here. And then the question is, what's dark matter? Is dark matter Vulcan, which means modified gravity, or Neptune, something else, like the new particles that we just cannot see. So, Let's go back to playing again. <laughs> what do you think dark matter is? A, Vulcan, a new law of gravity that we just don't really know. B, Neptune, an object that we just can't see. Again, if you really, really don't trust me, it could be both or neither. <laughs> Whoa, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, Vulcan is gaining steam, okay. That is so cool. Okay, I'm gonna do this all the time. Okay. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, seems to be stabilizing. 10 more seconds. Okay. Ready, everyone? I like that 20% is a neither. If you have any other creative ideas, I want to hear it. <laughs> okay, so for this one, actually, I'm not going to put the right answer because the very honest answer is we don't know. But as has been discussed earlier in the cafe, we think it actually is, oops, it's probably B, okay? Where it is an object that we just can't see. But that doesn't really rule out other things. It's just very, very difficult as I was discussed earlier. So, but let me show you one argument for why I think it's also B. It's the bully cluster, which also was mentioned earlier, but I have nice videos. So let's see, we have what we call galaxy clusters. Galaxy clusters are just a collection of galaxies that are all hanging out together, just because, so they make a bigger, bigger galaxy kind of thing. So just a group of very cool galaxies. And we can track their mass using gravitational lensing, which I'm not gonna get into, but you have to trust me that the blue thing here tracks where the mass is, okay? So then I'm gonna make these clusters collide and the inside of them is actually made out of gas. So these two gases can actually are gonna collide and gas is very collisional, which means that you know it creates these shock waves in the middle. So basically, if you didn't have dark matter, you would expect most of the mass to be right in the middle, following that red stuff. However, we see that most of the mass has gone really through. Like the blue stuff is just like, didn't care. Really, it's just sort of like, okay, I don't really see the gas, I'm just gonna move on. So this, this is the actual image of the discovery back in 2005, um, tells us that it's not really gas, it's, it's just that this other thing. So it's very hard to kind of reconcile modifying gravity with observations just like this, okay? So that's why, at least in my opinion, we're more looking into this world rather than this one, just because it's difficult to make this one work with our observations. But, you know, things can, we will find out when we find out, I guess. So now let me kind of, tell you a little bit more about dark matter. Let's put it into this whole space just so we understand where it fits. And for that, I'm gonna use some PhD comics. So if you look at the universe made out of pi, I think a lot of physicists must be very hungry. <laughs> there is food everywhere. Okay, so looking at the pie chart, what is the universe made of? Well, 5% of it is made out of matter that we're made out of. So that's my iPhone, the stars, everything. That's stuff we know. 20% dark matter. 75 is dark energy that I'm not even gonna get into. It's, yeah, so dark matter is actually five times as heavy as all the phones and Teslas and, and galaxies and everything that you have. So it's just like this very, very heavy stuff that is blobby that's everywhere and we cannot interact with it, we can't touch it, we just, uh, it's so close yet so far kind of situation. So in, the t in terms of our galaxy, what does it look like? Well. We live right here, and we're surrounded by this huge, what we call dark matter halo. And just to put some numbers here, we live at 26,000 light years, so kind of close to the edge. The disk of the galaxy is about 30,000 light years, and we're rotating at about 137 miles per second. Uh, no matter how far you speed in LA, you're not gonna get there. <laughs> and the halo of the dark matter actually is about an order of magnitude, so 300,000 light years further. So it's just like this huge thing that we're kind of swimming in, really. So now the question is, how can we detect it? And there are a lot of different methods for detection of dark matter, and I'm gonna focus on only one, um, just for the interest of time and kind of make sure that we, well, that we have to go home and eat something. Um, so, this is what we call direct detection. So direct detection is, for example, it's a huge tank of a few tons of xenon, really, and that is sitting very, very deep underground. 
So about a mile deep, like sometimes you have like a, you have to have a mine shaft or something. And that's because you want to isolate it from everything else that's hitting and you want it to be very, very quiet. And then what happens is that you have that xenon atom right there. You have dark matter coming in, properly colored. It comes in and it hits that xenon atom and then you see some scintillation light. Disclaimer, we haven't seen it yet, but ideally you would wanna see some scintillation light. And that's how you know dark matter will pass by your detector and that's how you can actually see it in a non-gravitational kind of way. However, however, this whole process does depend very, very critically on the speed of the dark matter, how fast it goes. You can see that if it kind of goes too slowly, you might not get enough scintillation. So, Again, I do apologize for the violence. Physics tends to be a little bit violent, but this is basically the same thing as, you know, crash dummies. So if it's going slow, you have some energy that is dissipated, but if it goes a lot faster, you're gonna have a lot more energy that you're gonna hit the wall with. So we might have more scintillation light in our experiment. So it's a lot easier to see. And yeah, maybe I should have sped up this video. <laughs> okay, so basically you can see that the damage at 100 kilometers an hour is a lot, lot more than the 50 that you can see all the way here. Also, BSA, wear a seatbelt. Just saying. <laughs> so now the question is, okay, we got dark matter. It has, we need to know how fast it's going to be able to kind of get it working within our detectors. But how can we measure the speed of something that we have not really seen? And then you might have some very good questions about my psyche, why I picked Wally Coyote, who is always failing at things, to be me, but uh, that's what happened. So I have a plan. That's me, dark matter's right there, and I'm gonna catch it. So how do I do that? Well, step one, I'm gonna find the stars that actually came with the dark matter because the dark matter that surrounds halos that actually surrounds other galaxies too. So when they come in together, I can see the stars, I can measure their speed. If I find those guys, they can kind of like snitch on their dark matter buddies and tell me how fast the dark matters go. Then I'm gonna measure their speed because I have my amazing, ridiculously expensive speed gun. And then I can put things together and deduce the dark matter speed. So I can show you here that from one of my billion simulations, uh, I do burn a lot of computer time, guys, um, that we have stars here, we have dark matter, and then we have a clump of stars inside that dark matter, and you can see them actually merging in. That's my galaxy right there. That's where I live, the sun. And you can see them actually going more or less in the same places. And indeed, because the, if you assume dark matter is collisionless, dark matter and stars are gonna behave the same way, so they're gonna end up you know, tracking each other, which means in, from simulations actually showed me that stars are actually a very good snitch on what the dark matter is doing. So I can just do that. And then, great, I can pick up my merger tree because I already know how fast each of these guys are going, so they can snitch on their dark matter buddies that actually they have been brought up with them. So great, I have step one all done. And then I can measure their speed, which I do with Gaia, and I can actually end up with plots like this. So in my simulation, for example, for mergers that look like in the Gaia Enceladus, for example, I can have these distributions. And basically the main thing that you need to see here is that the dark matter in black and the stars in red follow each other quite well. So this is just like the highway story. And then I can go into my data, see that the same thing is happening, Oof, amazing, which means that I can get a track of the dark matter. So I got their speed, and then the third thing, I can deduce the dark matter. So there you go, that's me, look alike. Dark matter is going, and then instead of catching it, I'm gonna do something a lot cooler which is put on a speed gun and I'm like, wait, let me see. Oh, you're going at 220 miles an hour. That's pretty cool. What actually I can do out of this is making sure that our experiments are tuned to the right velocities of dark matter. And then 
That way we can actually, once we see that scintillation light, we can actually know more accurately what are the properties of dark matter. And this is quite incredible and a work in progress, which is why the story continues. I found a picture where we have the same glasses, so I thought that was particularly fitting. And what we're doing now is really trying to build this merger tree and trying to understand the dark matter, and then we're gonna give it to our experimental um, colleagues, and hopefully they will tell us where dark matter is. So thank you, I'm gonna leave you with the Greek goddess of the night, Nyx, coming out of the galaxy, my amazing photoshopping skills, and a question for you. So if you were to discover a stellar stream, what would you call it? You can just type out the question. And thank you. <laughs> stream. <laughs> yeah, just like that boat. I like it. I really like it. <laughs> Guacamole, okay. <laughs> While you're thinking of more names for streams, has anyone wanted to ask Lena a question? Uh, this is a great opportunity. Yes, hi. Um, is there a key signature when two galaxies merge together? Oh, uh, yes. So um, just like that video of that big mergers, the gas is in the middle and kind of gets collided and there are like these shock waves. It would be uh, the gas from the two galaxies is gonna merge like that. Um, be more heat involved with the two mergers, and if you're looking at it, you only see you see way more heat than you should. Mm -hmm. Would that help as well? Unfortunately, the the gas has slightly different properties. So dark matter just like is transparent, kind of goes right through, and that's why the that collision. The collision is very helpful, actually, in telling you how much the dark matter interacts with itself. So, because gas interacts with itself, that's why it like it slams right in. And then dark matter moves right through in this particular case, which means that dark matter is not as collisional as the gas. And you can quantify that number and say, okay, then the dark matter self interaction is below this number just based on that observation. So yes, you're absolutely right. So if we see a lot more of these, they can tell us a lot about the properties of dark matter and how much it actually self interacts. George? Okay, that's my husband's name. I'll tell him that. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Yeah. So, for example, is actually complete. Oh yes. So, what are what are the properties of dark matter, so that we know how to detect it? Because we know it's not baseballs, um, right? So, the reason that we can detect baseballs is because you know when you hold one in your hand, the atoms in your uh, like from your palm uh, uh, kind of interact. It, there is like electromagnetism between that and the ball, which makes sure that the ball doesn't run fall right through your hand. Um, dark matter, it's actually perfectly consistent that dark matter does not interact with the stuff that we're made of. So electrons, protons, and stuff like that. It might interact with it very little, which is why we have experiments like xenon and we were just like, with like tons of xenon, they're just waiting. So eventually you're like, if you wait long enough, maybe one of them, one off will hit. Um, but it's also po completely possible that it doesn't interact that way which means that we are completely transparent to the dark matter, it just like goes right through. If you, like, you, we only see the stuff or feel it because we interact with it. And right now, dark matter only interacts gravitationally and gravity is very, very weak, so I can't tell. But on galactic scales, we can see that the motion of stars and the motion of galaxies is indeed affected, so there is that something there. As for the particular nature of dark matter, that's why this problem is so hard. We we only have evidence for it on like very, very large scales, not on very small scales. So that's why we're kind of casting a broader net. We have a lot of different experiments that are targeting different sizes of dark matter. Is it like a proton? Uh, does it weigh like a proton? Does it weigh like 
you know, 10 to the minus 20 or so times less than the proton? Is it the primordial black hole that is just sitting there with a few solar masses? We, it's, it's a very large kind of set of possibilities. And what we can constrain about it are just its gravitational properties. Yeah, hi. Yeah, dark matter, matter? Oh, that's a great question. So the question is, does dark matter interact with other dark matter? And that kind of goes back to the, the question that he asked. And right now what we have is an upper limit on how much it interacts with itself. And that's because in that collision that I showed, the bullet cluster, it kind of went right through. So if it interacted with itself, it would have gotten stuck in the middle, right? Like just that, like that gas. So we have a number. We can't really say for sure, but we have a number. So if we observe more of these systems, we'll be able to actually change that number. So yeah. Yeah? That's a very good question. So for that, we actually have model, uh, sorry, the question is, how can we know that this scintillation light is coming out of dark matter and, not, and nothing else? So we are, or not we, I'm a theorist, so you know, um, our experimentalist colleagues are actually really, really good at building their experiments, but also at controlling for what we call backgrounds. So they know the type of scintillation light that you would get from other things. So first of all, they shield their experiment, which is why it's a mile underground, which means that cosmic rays or whatever is happening on the surface is not gonna get all the way through it, through to it. The other thing is that they have models, for example, for um, in, in case they, they choose their material very carefully. That's why, for example, xenon is a noble gas, but also, the material that the experiment is made of, made out of, they, they want to make sure it doesn't, you know, decay or something. And if it does, they can model a lot of these scintillation and they have very different properties from what the dark matter would. So these are actually experiments that are, as of now, almost background free because they understand their background and living in a different space. Unfortunately, very soon, other particles from the standard model called neutrinos are gonna start behaving just like the dark matter and we're gonna be able to, they will be making some scintillation light. And then it gets a little bit tricky because it's gonna be more of a numbers game of we expect this many neutrinos. Are we gonna see more than expected or not when we need to understand our backgrounds? So yeah, the short answer, experimentalists are great. They understand their backgrounds, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's a very difficult question that takes a lot <laughs> to solve. Uh, neutrinos from the sun. Solar neutrinos, yeah, they're coming for us. Uh, they actually go through us all the time, but you know, it's okay. They don't really see us. Should we have any more questions for Lena? I mean, maybe while people are thinking, I can ask a quick one. Uh, was there like a short list of names that landed on Nix, or was it just. Oh, the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, we narrowed it down, basically we had to, well, we wanted a Greek goddess, so we had to use the link for that. And then I was like, you know, I had to pick a letter, and I was like, well, my last name starts with N, so let's do that. And there are three goddesses that start with the letter N. One is Nike, for the goddess of victory, and I was like, I'm not gonna name my stellar stream after shoes. The second one was Nemesis, and I was like, that's so tempting, but no. <laughs> And the third one was Nick's, and I was like, yeah, we gotta have to do this one, so yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Any more questions? Okay, if not, join me in thanking our professor. Thank you so much. <laughs>